Hi, and welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast, where we hope to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming and food production. This is your host, Michael. Today's podcast guest was Lindley Dixon. Now, Lindley owns a five-acre mixed vegetable farm in Durango, Colorado, marketing through Southwest Farm Fresh, Farm the Table, and Durango Farmers Market. She owns the farm with her husband, brother, and eight-year-old daughter. So she holds an MS in plant and soil science from West Virginia University and a PhD in plant pathology from the University of Florida. In addition, she has held a two-year postdoctorate with the USDA Systematic Botany and Mycology Laboratory where she studied fungal plant pathogens from around the world. She's also the Associate Director for the Real Organic Project, which helps educate and connect farmers and eaters by providing more transparency on organic farming practices. So a lot of things we covered in this episode. Um, we talked about how tough it can be finding land in the West. Um, we talked about access to water out there and how important and challenging that can be. And we also talked about her work with the Real Organic Project and the important work that they're doing to educate consumers about transparency in our food systems. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. So why don't you give us a little bit of background about you? Because I've, um, I've seen your name a few different times, but I'm not sure our audience has kind of, you know, your background. You started in pathology, you did a lot of work with tomato diseases, and now you've kind of moved into, you worked with the Cornucopia Institute. So tell us about your journey into the whole organic world. Sure. I kind of feel like a lot of farmers feel this way too, that farming was a calling, but it took me a little bit longer to get into it than I thought. I went to school for a really long time. So um, I went to a master's degree program after college in organic agriculture at West Virginia University. And at the time, there were only a few universities that were studying organic food systems. And so that's why I chose West Virginia University. And there I studied plant and soil science. And it was so funny because my main advisor, Jim Coatson, was like, these farmers, these organic farmers, all they talk about is soil health and the soil and, and biodiversity. And they seem to think that this is the key and there's no research out there to show this. And so one of the first things we did was go visit all the organic farms in the mid-Atlantic region take a look at the biodiversity levels on the farm and try to correlate it with the level of disease. And we were measuring, you know, plant biodiversity, but we were also looking at, you know, soil nematodes and mycorrhizal interactions. And sure enough, you know, higher diversity levels show uh, fewer diseases. But, you know, it's something that organic farmers have always known. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So then after that, um, I actually took a break and thought, you know, Maybe I don't want to be in research forever. You know, you get so specialized. Um, and I worked for extension out on Guam, actually, which is in the Pacific Ocean. So I was uh, diagnosing diseases there and looking at biocontrol of weeds. So we were checking out what are some of the diseases that are on weeds there and might they be able to be used for control? Uh, you know, if you actually can culture the fungal pathogen, you might be able to control the weed by spraying that pathogen. So um, that's, that's called biocontrol. And the University of Florida was doing work like that. So I started looking at, at their research. And then a, a fungal disease called target spot of cucumber and tomato really hit the scene hard in Florida and Guam at the same time. And so I actually uh, was able to get a PhD studying those interactions. And that study looked at the really broad host range of this fungus. And um, we were able to kind of show that there are isolates that are specific to individual hosts by looking at the genetic components of the different isolates and realize that there really is host specificity, even though it has such a broad host range. So that was my PhD. And then, you know, I worked, I didn't have a lot of experience in farming, but in the back of my head, it was always, I'm, I'm going to do this at some point. I'm going to have a mixed vegetable farm. And I only spent one month when I was uh, in high school on a CSA farm up in Maine. And I just remembered that experience so much, thinking at some point in my life, I'm going to do this. Her name was Bambi Jones and the farm was Hidden Valley Farm. She had a bad back. And I remember that she was only 40 or something and she, it was hard for her to bend over and pick the beans. And I always remember thinking, I don't want to be too old when I finally get this going. You know, I, I want to yes. be able to be my best strong self. And so it took a couple of years doing a postdoc and research. And, you know, I got to the point where I was like in a lab coat every day and I would walk out at the end of the day of the building 
and I hadn't seen the day at all. And I just thought that's enough. I've got to quit now and go give this farming thing a try because I've always known it's something I wanted to do. And so, you know, after two years of doing um, postdoc research at the USDA in Maryland, after my uh, PhD, I decided to uh, leave the East Coast, which is where I grew up and was working uh, with the USDA and just go out to Colorado and uh, give it a shot. Okay, cool. So tell us a little bit about the farm that you did out there. Uh, so we didn't have any land. And the scene out here is that land is incredibly expensive. Really mm-hmm. good farmland has water rights. The water rights are very tricky to get a hold of. And you can get a farm with water rights, but they may not get you through the full season. And so I decided not to buy a farm right away, even though we had had some savings. So we actually ended up just renting a plot in town and um, giving it a go. And we had a 150 member CSA, like we went hard fast and um, on farm pickup and everything was awesome, but the rent just kept going up on us. And Uh it was clear that the landowner wasn't on our side. And so we actually jumped around on three different plots over the course of six years, you know, had all kinds of problems. Like one year we got hit by hail. All of those plots had herbicide carryover residues in the soil. So though we were farming organically, we had to wait for that three-year transition. And we kept realizing that if we don't find a a steady plot, we're just going to be starting over all the time. And we actually were going to quit farming. And a knock on the door came from um, someone in the area that had good farmland And he said, we want to get farmers on our land. And then over the course of the last two years, we've been able to apply for an FSA loan and make that happen. So we're on about five acres now with awesome water rights. Uh, So we're really excited about our future. Yeah, that is something I've worked with farmers, you know, Colorado, Utah, and that is something that every single time it is a massive discussion is how do you make sure that you have water one? And then two, how do you make sure you have water in the fall and spring? Because they only turn the system on for specific times of the year. Right. So talk to us about the climate of Colorado. Obviously, it's a little bit, there's not much water, but is anything else that makes farming out there unique? Uh, I did mention hail. Yeah. Um, you'll get a passing hailstorm once a year. And so we've actually started using those Dubois low caterpillar tunnel systems. Okay. Yep. To protect some of our, like our long season crops. Uh, and of course, a lot of the farm is under remay. We get really heavy winds in the spring. Okay. Really cold night, you know, like a tomato doesn't like to get below 65 degrees. And every single night, even in, you know, the hottest July months is about 55 degrees. So like the first year I grew tomatoes and they were all green when the frost came. So I didn't get a single ripe tomato the first year. And like, this is my specialty. So (laughs) that was a tough blow. Um, What else? Gosh, gophers, the pH of the soil is eight here because it's high. So we're dealing with high pH soils. Yep. How do you combat that? Uh, organic matter. We are we're really big into composting and just trying to bring, yeah, the organic matter of our soils up. And, you know, if you irrigate they'll naturally come down a little bit. But as soon as you add that organic matter and that biological activity, the pH of the soil evens out. Gotcha. So let's talk a little bit about now you've been farming for a couple of years. Do you still love it? Is that something you want to do the rest of your life? I do love it. It's definitely a calling. I also have this side of me that loves the political side of it. I really Uh believe strongly that we have a right to farm. And I saw how close, like if we want to farm, we should be able to do it. And there's this whole generation of people that want to farm right now because of environmental reasons and just kind of a burnout of, you know, spending your life behind a desk and behind a computer screen. And so many of them are not getting over that hump of land ownership. And I was so close to being one of them. And if I hadn't gotten that knock on the door, I would have gone back into academia and research and I would have kind of lost this dream of mine. And fortunately, my husband and brother are here to help me in their farming full time. And so now that I I've got this kind of opportunity through the Real Organic Project, which we can talk about soon, but to, to kind of fight for farmers' rights to farm. I can, you know, keep my feet wet on the farm, but I can also kind of follow this calling of, of fighting for that right for all these people who want to do it to raise awareness about, about them and, and how can we get them on the land. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's an important thing we see all across the U S is that access to, and we do know that, you know, the next, is it 20 years, 50% of the land in the U S will change hands. So we're at a a crux right now of that happening, but how do we steer that conversation? Absolutely. So let's kind of move into sustainable agriculture. What does a sustainable farm mean to you? 
There are so many aspects of it. And I think organic movement has been all about standards. And while I agree that there need to be standards, I also have never been allowed to be organic for the last eight years because my plot, you know, has moved around so long. So I'm actually, you know, one of those people that believes that it's a shame that we've kind of lost. I've lost this identity under organic that am I an organic farmer? You know, even though I'm like composting and cover Uh crop doing all these wonderful things. So for me, um, what makes a sustainable farm is someone who is constantly thinking about the entire, like the holistic approach to all of their systems and trying to improve the sustainability of every one of those, you know, complex interactions on the farm. And so, you know, maybe you're rocking the composting, um, but you're, you're like, oh gosh, I'm still driving three hours, three times a week to get my produce to market. And so you're even thinking about that end of it. Or maybe you're right in town and you you don't have access to fertility. And so you're having to bring in your fertility as in, it could be an organic source of fertility, but maybe it's fish emulsion. And you kind of dive into, oh my gosh, they're harvesting fish from the sea in order to you know grind them up and put them on my farm. That doesn't feel right either. And so you're kind of like taking a step back at everything you're doing and trying to imp- improve the sustainability with the knowledge that you're never ever going to get there, but you're always thinking about it and, and you're always trying to improve those, those systems. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's really good. So you've had a long history in, you know, agriculture and a lot of the academia too. Tell us about, you know, one of the mentors that you've met across along the way and uh, what were the big lesson that you took away from that interaction? Uh, yeah, there've been so many. Uh, Elliot Coleman, of course, has always been a hero of mine. And actually, I got to meet him at one of the National Organic Standards Board meetings in Stowe when the farmers were protesting the idea that um, soil might not be a part of organic farming anymore, that hydroponics would be allowed. And so I met him there and I actually, I started crying. And and the first thing he said to me was, don't cry. And he gave me this big hug. (laughs) And um, he's, he's just always been such a hero of mine because of his attention to detail and how much he has cared for the soil and believed that soil is ultimately what makes a healthy plant and then a a healthy human who eats that plant. And so that integration, that kind of holistic approach to the health of the entire ecosystem, that's uh, stayed with me. I've also loved Wendell Berry. And at a pretty young age, I read The Unsettling of America and Uh that concept that we're losing our uh, small towns in America because of the type of agriculture that we're promoting in this country. And so that hit me hard as well. Yeah, absolutely. The more and more we watch, the Midwest just keeps turning into more and more farmland and less and less people. Right. So, um, yeah. So let's move on to talking about the Real Organic Project. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about the need for an add-on label. Right. So uh, there have been some problems in organic for a long time. The majority of the farmers are these awesome, biodiverse, organic family farmers And so the organic community hasn't really want to talk about, you know, some of the problems that we've had for fear of harming these incredible farmers that are under the organic label that have worked their whole lives to build this movement. And I completely get that after visiting these organic farms this summer to be part of the Real Organic Project program. But the the reality is that there is enforcement lacking at the National Organic Program level. That's their job is to enforce the standards. And, you know, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with kind of the whole, the way it works is that the the standards were developed and that they're accredited certifying agencies, ACAs they're called, that actually come to your farm and the inspector will look at your farm and make sure that you qualify. But they're not the ones that actually do the enforcement. So they write a recommendation that, yes, this farm should be certified or know this problem has some issues that need work. But ultimately, it is the National Organic Program's job to enforce those standards and make sure every certified farm is meeting the letter of the law. And uh, the Washington Post in the last couple of years has, has come out with a series of reports showing that some of the huge dairies aren't getting their cows out for proper grazing. And uh, some of the imports coming into the country are just outright fraudulent on a massive scale um, when it comes to grain. The poultry conditions have have been really bad to the point where it's almost like this example that if we don't talk about this, 
then what happened in poultry is going to happen in every sector of organic. And that's just these huge, massive buildings. The, the organic law requires outdoor access for poultry. And it's this really cynical version of what outdoor access would look like. And it's just basically like you have these huge, you know, 200,000 bird buildings with these tiny little doors and this tiny access to a barn. You know, it's almost like a porch that has no soil. And so even if the birds did get out there, which there isn't enough space for all of them to get out there, there's, there's absolutely no reason why they'd want to be out there. There's no, you know, worms to scratch and find or, you know, dust baths or all the things that makes a chicken a chicken. So that's happened in the poultry industry to the point where now if you go buy eggs that are organic in the market, you know, 90% of them are come from these porches. And so it's just a real cautionary tale of what can happen if we don't fix the system before it pretty much takes over. And so I think that's why the, the farmers have come together to say, no, we're not going to let that happen in dairy. We're not going to let that happen in vegetables. And so the Real Organic Project has formed a grassroots farmer-led effort to take control of organic standards and make sure they stay strong because it really is such an awesome movement. You know, it's a, it's a success full farmer-led movement from the beginning and they want it to stay that way. Yeah, because the original organic movement was started by the farmers who wanted to offer something different. You know, we thought bringing in the, you know, government oversight would kind of help nationalize and help standardize it. But what's happened is it's just ended up diluting it. Right. It's such a great success story that the people who kind of laughed and said, that's not going to be anything are saying, wow, I want a piece of this now. And they're, they're getting a piece of it. Unfortunately, um, they're bending the rules to meet how they're growing and how they're doing things instead of changing how their production systems in order to match the standards. Gotcha. So what are some of the specific ways that the standards are different for the Real Organic Project? Yeah. So number one, poultry, we require that birds are actually in contact with soil require that that soil is vegetated even. Okay. So, so it really encourages rotation because basically if you put chickens in one spot, they're going to make it so that the vegetation is gone over time. So, you know, not only do they have access to soil, but it really doesn't outright require rotation, but because we require that the soil be vegetated, it basically ensures that those uh, poultry will be moved and not, you know, over contaminate with their manure one spot, just keep the land healthy. So that's, that's one area. The other area is that we require um, the maintenance of soil fertility. And so number one, we require that you do grow in the soil. I think the organic farmers have always acknowledged the complexity of the soil systems and, and never thought that we could actually replace what the soil does with a fertility input, because that's one of their core beliefs. You know, we require in-soil growing and look at how are you fostering fertility in the soil. So that's part of our standards. Those are two really big differences. Gotcha. Now talk about the inspection process. Is that someone from your team that comes out and does the actual inspections or how does it work? That is evolving. This year was just the pilot program and I actually had the opportunity to visit over 55 farms around the country myself. The goal is for um, the pilot farms to be able to say, this standard makes sense, this one doesn't make sense. And then I'm able to kind of get that bigger picture across, you know, all the different growing regions in the country and then take that information back to the standards board. And, you know, this winter, we're then going to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? What standards do we need to change? And, and you know, how can we grow this program out? And we, we have yet to figure that out. We meet this winter to solve some of those questions. Gotcha. Who are some of the farmers who have uh, signed on to this? We have some of the most amazing longtime organic farmers in the country. Uh, and at the same time, we have some really awesome new growers who um, are young and, and doing everything right as well. So it's a, it's a pretty nice mix. We've got geographically farms from all over the country. So, um, you know, just a great example, of like uh, we've got Radiance Dairy, who's Francis Thickey owns that in Iowa. We actually have started releasing uh, once a week videos of the farms on our website. If you click on the videos tab, it's the realorganicproject.org. You can click on the videos tab and see all these farms. So once a week, we'll be releasing another one. But where I started there, uh, Radiance Dairy is this longtime organic dairy that Francis Thickey has been on the National Organic Standards Board. Like during his time there, he was able to really see some of the problems that are inherent in the National Organic Program. 
and he's actually been very vocal and written about them. And so he's he's on our board and um, his dairy is just such a great example of this longtime farm that's been able to take what was monoculture conventional grain production and actually build the soils on these sloping hills with his grazing systems. And he talks about that, how he's done that in his video. So we've got that farm. And at the same time, we've got in Maine, this other dairy, these are, you know, young kids that are out there starting their own dairy from scratch. And they just got dropped by Horizon Cooperative who comes and picks up their milk. And so they're having to figure out, okay, now what? Like, do we have to bottle the milk ourselves on our farm and, and keep this going? So I think there's just this incredible diversity of stories at all stages of the process. But at the core of it is this belief that, you know, organic is the way that it is salvageable, um, that the majority of farms under the label are still doing everything in the true, like, you know, spirit of the organic movement and the letter of the law, and that there's just this small minority of, unfortunately, really massive operations that are tainting the whole system. And so we just need to get on top of that. Yeah, I think we're looking at, you know, it's 5% of the farms, which are the ones misbehaving, but they're taking, you know, 50 or plus percentage of the market. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I saw a video just this morning of one of uh, actually my personal heroes, John Paul Cortez with Roxbury Farms. So oh, nice. um, yeah, it was great to see that and that he's um, on board with this project as he's, you know, he's been farming for a very long time in the Hudson Valley and does a phenomenal job on their farm with making sure that everything stays organic and real. We do have some really incredible farmers that are heroes to the next generation. So, you know, my hope is that the organic community is very complex and they, they tend to bash heads a lot. And the reality is we're, we're all on the same team. And so my hope is that we really can all come together and um, save it and just not worry about our slight differences. Because in reality, we're, you know, if we're fighting over these little things that are so close, but the things that we're trying to get rid of are just so far outside of what we're talking about that that's where we need to focus and then if we're successful doing that then we can you know talk about these slight differences that are over here you know yes absolutely. so i really hope we all come together yeah so talk to me about because i know there's some other add-on programs out there how do you differ from them and where do you see as you said coming together on making sure that we do prevent i mean not prevent but kind of a uh, show a more unified front for the organic label Right. And, and everybody, that's their big thing is we don't want to create consumer confusion. We want organic to mean organic. And these add-on labels are just going to create confusion. And I would agree. I'm, I'm so sorry that we're here. And I'm so sorry that you can't just go and look for that USDA organic label and then be done. But that's just not where we are. And so the reality is we do have to do something to save this label if we want it to be meaningful into the future. So I know a bunch of groups have realized that we've got problems and we do, we are, we're taking different approaches. The Real Organic Project is basically saying that we are going to enforce the standards as they are written and that the Organic Foods Production Act is a great law and, and let's just enforce it. And so what's happened in the last year is that over a, a decade, the organic community passed the Organic Livestock and Poultry Production Rule. It was called the OLPP, and it's also been known as just the Animal Welfare Standards. And the Trump administration just dropped it. So it took us 10 years to say, guess what? We believe chickens should be out on soil. And that's what that law was getting rid of all of those poultry barns. So I think what we've realized is that we've just completely lost control as an organic community. And um, the Real Organic Project is just trying to get that back. And we would so happily fold as soon as the process of the organic community and the National Organic Standards Board making a recommendation and then the National Organic Program accepting that recommendation, if that all started to function again, we would walk away, go back mm -hmm. to our farms because these are all farmers. They don't want to be doing this. They want to farm. We're just basically saying, let's save organic as it is. And then there are a bunch of other groups that are trying to push the organic standards beyond and look at, you know, really great things too, like worker welfare and carbon drawdown and, um, yeah, no-till, things like that. Yeah, we're saying if we can fix the process first, then we can move the needle forward once we fix the basics here. Gotcha, gotcha. So how do you envision educating the consumer on the difference of this new label? We're letting the farmers do it. Uh, so part of the inspection process includes a video interview of the farmer on their land, explaining their 
organic production practices and why they matter. And it's so great because that is such a big question and every farmer has a different answer. And so, um, gosh, these videos are amazing too. I, I hope a lot of people are, are able to watch them because it's, it's so inspiring to see a farmer talk about their farm on their farm. Everybody, every farmer loves to do that. And so these farmers, they know so much and they're so inspiring. That's, that's how we're educating the community. And so I really hope that people are going to go watch them because they're great. Awesome. Awesome. So what do you feel then? I think we've kind of uh, talked about this a bit, but what do you feel that the future holds for the organic label? Um, it's scary. I mean, we've lost it in so many ways. We've, we've lost the animal welfare. Um, I know the National Organic Program knows that there are problems with grazing for dairy and they have yet to decertify one farm. So I'm a little cynical that the National Organic Program is going to get it together and start getting some of these massive operations that just are not meeting the letter of the law and just decertifying them. There is so much money that is behind these operations. And to be frank, the, the certifiers are benefiting from that as well. You know, if you have a client that is massive like Driscoll's and they have 4,000 acres of hydroponic berries, they are paying you a lot of money to get certified. And so there's this conflict of interest at every step of the way. So I am a little nervous and um, maybe realistic about the idea that this might not work to reclaim the National Organic Program and that we might, the Real Organic Project might have to stick around for a while as much as I would love it to not be necessary to exist at all. But I, I'm a little cynical at this point because the National Organic Program has known for so long that there are problems and they have yet to fix them. Mm, yeah, that's unfortunate. All right. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been great. It's really been exciting to hear where this is headed and kind of the reasons behind it. Um, imagine you're standing in front of future farmers and I know you see new farmers coming all the time. They're battling their way through the fears, worries, doubts, and struggles to start their farm. What are two or three strategies you would recommend they focus on to best ensure success? Yeah, I'd love to go back and tell my beginning farmer self a lot of things. I think the biggest one is if you're not okay with failure, then don't get into this. And uh, don't take your failures so hard because it happens to the best of us and, and keep going and learn from it, right? Don't make the same mistake twice. So, so be okay with failure. You know, I have this scientific background and it's funny because so much of the organic community is very anti-science. So I think I would tell myself to um, really embrace that scientific background, that understanding of complexity and all the systems. You know, we have more in common with the organic community than we have differences. And I think the scientific community has really let organic farmers down um, over time here by just kind of failing to acknowledge that the organic community does have respect for that complexity and they just want to work within it and not understand every step of the process. So I guess I would tell myself that it's not an either or it's not, you know, you're organic and then you're anti-science or you're pro-science. And that means that you can't be part of the organic community. I would say the two are more alike than they are different. And then the last thing I would say is surround yourself with people who understand how hard it is mm. and want to give towards the effort and help you. Because I think ultimately it takes every single person who's involved in getting, you know, this kind of really good food onto the plates of your community. You're going to feel like you're giving more than you're getting back. And so if you're working with a landowner that, you know, they really just want to get their rent, then get out, you know, work with people that really believe in this movement and want to help you. And, and, you know, that restaurant that's willing to pay a little bit more, and then you have to come down a little bit on your pricing. And so both of you feel like you're giving towards it in order to make it work. So yeah, surround yourself with people that get it. All right. And there you have it, folks. That was great. You know, those are three really, really good points. And I think that, you know, that's going to serve any new farmer very well to kind of take those in mind. Thank you so much again for coming on the program, Dr. Dixon. Thank you, Michael, for having me. It was really fun. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.